This video is brought to you by Morning Brew. Hi, welcome to another episode of Cold Fusion. Last time, in our Intel mini-series, we looked at how the company invented the CPU microprocessor in 1971, and by the 2010s, were at the top of their game. They became the go-to processor company in every consumer desktop product and an unstoppable force, or so it seemed. In today's episode, we'll see how Intel's size became a hindrance and how, behind the scenes, they were trying to kill competition with bribes and monopolistic tactics. Let's take a look. You are watching Cold Fusion TV. Despite its brilliant start and massive size, in recent years, Intel has seen bureaucracy and brain drain. Vital executives have left, and accountants and business majors became major decision makers. But I can tell you in Silicon Valley, I came here in 1970, Intel was exactly two years old. Uh, the very first year uh, working at Stanford in my PhD in integrated electronics, I met Noyce and Moore and they began a recruiting process. Uh, I wanted to know what I was gonna work on that was gonna change the world. And now we've got a CEO there talking about which parts he's gonna chop off and sell. And we've got, you know, the buzzards flying around uh, talking about, you know, strategic options and stuff like that. Not okay, something's gotta change. Well, what needs to change? Well, they need a new CEO. The CEO needs to be technical. If you look at advanced micro devices, for example, uh, they've caught up tremendously on, on Intel in Intel's area, and their CEO is a PhD and also a good CEO. So you, you've got to get somebody that's respected by the technical community for sure. According to the employer rating agency, Glassdoor, only 84% of the firm's workers recommend the company, and 85% of them recommend the CEO. Meanwhile, at AMD and NVIDIA, 99% of employees recommend their CEOs. Intel insiders have noted the extensive use of cheap foreign contractors whose working visas are used to hold them to ransom. These foreign workers are only assigned specific tasks and can't stray from it, a far cry from the free experimentation that Robert Noyce encouraged back in episode one. To make things worse, Intel spends $13 billion in research and development Meanwhile, NVIDIA spends $3 billion, and AMD, under the leadership of Dr. Lisa Su, spends just $1.8 billion. And for all of that spending that Intel does, they don't have much to show for themselves. In fact, as you'll later see, the company has been embroiled in scandals and anti-competitive behaviour, events that have been largely missed by the public eye. We'll get to the juicy details of Intel's dirty tactics in the second half of this episode, but before we get to all of that, Let's take a look at how Intel lost the mobile market. As we saw in a Cold Fusion episode about Apple's ARM-based M1 chip, Intel missed the boat on the mobile revolution. The company had the opportunity to make chips for Apple's upcoming iPhone, but then CEO Paul Ottolini just didn't see it as a profitable venture. In the end, Intel passed on the opportunity, leaving the door wide open for ARM-based designs. But this wasn't the full story. Contrary to popular belief, Intel wasn't caught completely off guard by the rise of smartphones and mobile devices. They saw ARM-based chips coming and decided to get in on the action. As far back as 2002, they used ARM-based designs in what they called the Intel X-Scale processor series. But due to poor sales and bad management, the project was abandoned and sold off in 2006 before any real success. But they kept trying. And by 2014, Intel was losing a billion dollars per quarter in failed mobile endeavors. Next, the firm would throw $4 billion per year at tablet manufacturers, and this was to encourage them to use Intel CPUs. It kind of worked, but as soon as Intel stopped paying, the tablet manufacturers would switch back to ARM-based chips. By 2016, Intel just gave up on the mobile market, with over $10 billion being lost in trying. Out of all the semiconductor giants, Intel is in a unique position. They're the only ones that own and operate chip manufacturing plants. This vertical integration means that Intel employees not only have to design the chips, but also have to figure out how to manufacture them, all the way down to the transistors at the nanometer level. Admittedly, it's not an easy job. 
The thing is, none of Intel's competitors do this, not AMD or Nvidia. Instead, they use companies such as Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, known as TSMC, Global Foundries, or Samsung to produce their chips. For the longest time for Intel, making their own chips in-house was seen as an advantage, but recently, they just haven't been able to keep up. To understand exactly what Intel is struggling with, we have to talk a little bit about how CPU chips are made. Modern CPUs are made using photolithography, where an image of a CPU is etched onto a piece of silicon. The exact method of how this is done is usually referred to as the process node and is measured by how small a manufacturer can make the transistors. As a rule of thumb, the smaller the transistors, the better. As transistors get tinier and more tightly packed, electrons don't have to physically travel as far when moving between them. This saves both calculating time and energy. Smaller transistors also mean that calculations can be done without getting too hot, and that's usually a limiting factor in CPU performance. So for example, with 7 nanometer transistors compared to 14 nanometers, you can get 25% more performance under the same power. It almost seems like magic, but that's how it works. There's a bit more to the story in terms of how you classify node sizes, but overall, that's the basic concept. So, the problems for Intel all started on September 5th, 2014. That's the day that Intel introduced their fifth generation core chips. These were supposed to be monumental, the company's first processors using a 14 nanometer manufacturing process. Intel was at the cutting edge, while AMD remained stuck on the 28 nanometer process. Intel wasn't going to sit still. Their original plans had roadmaps for 10 nanometers to launch in 2016 with even more advanced 7 nanometer chips launching in 2018. But from here, things slowly went wrong. To reach the 10 nanometer stage, Intel tried to use exotic technology to aggressively increase their chip density, but it backfired, and majorly. The technical issues in solving this saw seven years of delays, and to this day, Intel's current 10th gen core desktop processors remain on a heavily optimized, but still, 14 nanometer process, and all of these delays opened the door for its competitors. On the other side of the fence for AMD, after some setbacks, and with the help of TSMC, AMD struck back big time with their new Ryzen chip processors in 2017. It featured up to 16 cores on a 14 nanometer process. It was a monster that slaughtered Intel in multi-threaded tasks and overall value, but it still lagged behind in gaming and single thread performance. But in 2018, the second generation Ryzen chip from AMD improved both performance and price. In 2019, with Intel still stuck on 14 nanometers, AMD took the technological lead with its third gen Ryzen CPUs, now being built on an advanced 7 nanometer process. But there was a few intricacies going on behind the scenes. Intel was still hanging in there. They had been fine tuning the performance of their 14 nanometer processors and had greatly enhanced integrated graphics. But many technological commentators saw all of this as a technical failing on Intel's behalf. As it stands, Intel's unreleased and upcoming 11th gen seems like it's about 4% faster than AMD in gaming, despite still being 14 nanometer. However, in multi-threaded workloads like content creation, AMD is offering better value, with more cores and threads for the money, and it could just be a matter of time before Intel is overtaken even in gaming. And this isn't going over silently. Consumers have been noticing Intel's slips. Intel not only pushed back 10 nanometer chips to the end of 2021, I mean, friggin' 2021, they also moved 7 nanometer production to a much later date, 2022 or beyond. You know that even after slashing your prices as much as 50% on your rehashed hardware, you've still got nothing. And you'll grasp at any desperate strategy to avoid any direct comparisons against your competitor's product. With this plan to launch first by a matter of hours. Why? So that the launch day reviews, which tend to get referenced by buyers over the entire product life cycle, couldn't contain direct comparisons to something you were afraid was going to be better. You are a weasel and you are a chicken. You seek to misrepresent the strength of your products to consumers, weasel, 
and you seek to duck away from a fight rather than take the criticism that you know you deserve. Chicken. Uh, nothing special, another Ryzen 1600. I'm gonna, just, I'm gonna have to do like the Intel edition just to see if anyone's still running Intel systems these days. Oh my God, they're all Ryzen. Intel's dead now, aren't they? <laughs> wow, if this doesn't just tell you how much momentum AMD has. AMD's success is all thanks to the chip manufacturing company, TSMC, who ramped up their seven nanometer process extremely fast. This is something that Intel simply couldn't compete with in-house and TSMC isn't sitting still they're planning to move to 5 nanometers this year. If this allows AMD to get to 5 nanometers in their desktop chips before Intel hits 10 nanometers, Intel may be in trouble. Remember, Intel was supposed to have 10 nanometers back in 2015. And to make things worse, the upcoming 4th gen Ryzen chips from AMD are using a 5 nanometer process and are said to be 40% faster in overall performance. You've had big problems with 10 nanometer now with seven, who and what at Intel is responsible for this string of problems? Well, I mean, ultimately, um, I'm, I'm responsible. Before we continue, let's take a look at some Intel news brought to you by today's sponsor, Morning Brew. Despite all of their problems, Intel brought in record sales due to the pandemic. More people working from home meant more people buying laptops with Intel chips in them. The interesting thing about this was that Intel was forced to reveal their sales numbers early after they had been hacked. Intel's problems are getting so severe that investors such as Third Point are calling for Intel to split up its design and manufacturing operations. If you want more stories like this one and are interested in science, technology and business, Morning Brew is a great way to catch up on all the latest news if you're short on time. It pulls together quality news sources all in one place without you having to put in the effort. It's delivered straight to your email inbox each weekday and Saturday, and it's free. It takes just five seconds to sign up, so click the link in the description below to get started. AMD has gained market share for 10 straight quarters, breaking 20% desktop market share for the first time since 2013. AMD's Ryzen desktop CPUs has remained on top of Amazon's CPU bestseller list for years now. According to CEO Lisa Su, in 2020, Ryzen CPUs were topping the retailer bestseller lists and have more than 50% share of premium processor sales at many top global retailers. There's no denying that AMD is at their best. And in saying this, AMD has been a thorn in the side of Intel for the better part of four decades. A thorn that Intel has been trying to remove. As you saw in the last episode of this series, AMD began life licensing Intel's designs as a secondary source supplier. If you remember, Intel had to do this as a chip manufacturer because building chips back then was seen as unreliable and companies wanted the confidence that they could receive a chip if there was an issue with one supplier. The bickering between the two companies began in the early 1980s. Even though Intel had signed a partnership with AMD, they decided to break the agreement internally by refusing to exchange the designs and intellectual property with AMD. This would result in a long legal dispute that went to the California Supreme Court. The court found that Intel violated AMD's rights. Intel was also accused of obstruction of justice. During the trial, they repeatedly stalled and gave useless information. By this stage, Intel had taken the lead by hampering AMD's progress. In 1996, AMD was forced to make their own processors from the ground up, called the Athlon series, these new AMD CPUs ended up being faster than Intel's Pentium 3 and much faster than Intel's Pentium 4. Over the coming years, Intel became nervous and needed to protect their product sales at all costs. In the early 2000s, Intel would offer money to Japanese companies such as NEC, Fujitsu, Toshiba, Sony and Hitachi, as well as German retailers this bribe money was so that these companies would not use AMD parts and sell Intel-based laptops and CPUs instead. AMD sued Intel for antitrust. Intel's response? It was AMD's fault that they were failures in the marketplace. In 2004, the offices of Intel's Japanese subsidiary was raided during an investigation. Intel was ruled to have violated antitrust laws in 2005. The next year, the Intel offices in Korea were raided for the same reason. Intel had also violated antitrust laws there too. Next, Intel German offices would be raided in 2008, same reason. 
starting to see a pattern? Intel's many international bribes to companies to shut out AMD processors from the market would be uncovered and they would be fined over a billion dollars for it. It got worse though. In 2009, even companies like Dell, HP, NEC and Lenovo were all involved in Intel's bribes. In the legal filings, it was stated that consumers even asked for cheaper and better performing AMD chips, but Dell refused. Dell wanted to keep receiving money from Intel, which was making up 104% of their quarterly income at one stage. Another antitrust lawsuit was filed by the District of New York in 2009. It revealed $6 billion in quarterly payments from Intel to Dell from 2001 to 2006. In 2010, Intel was caught faking benchmarks by using custom code that could detect which CPU the benchmark was running on. Benchmarks are seen by consumers as an easy way to determine which products have better performance. If this particular benchmark saw that it was running on an Intel CPU, it would run a highly optimized code. If it saw something else, it would run the slowest version of the code it could find. This misled consumers and manufacturers alike, and Intel were prosecuted by the FTC over this. And it just kept going. In 2018, with the launch of the AMD Ryzen Threadripper, a monster 32-core CPU, Intel had to think of something. So their marketing team went into overdrive. Intel would retaliate against AMD by demonstrating the power of their 5 GHz 28-core processor. It looked awesome in benchmarks, but there was only one issue. Intel would later claim that they somehow forgot to mention that this demo chip was overclocked and required a 1,700 watt industrial freezer to keep it from overheating. As demonstrated, the performance that Intel was showing off didn't exist in any chip they currently had. In 2019, with the launch of their Core i9-9900K, the benchmark showed a massive performance advantage over AMD. The only problem, some of these benchmarks were sponsored by Intel. And as it turned out, through software, the Intel-sponsored benchmarks disabled the number of cores of AMD chips by half. Intel would go on to fabricate many benchmarks throughout the year, and you can check out the channel Adored TV if you want a detailed overview of Intel's bad practices. To me, it's really amazing that Intel has been operating like this for decades, but most people just aren't aware. They struggled with innovation, so they settled for dirty tactics. There was a time at Intel where we, the people used to joke that they kept Advanced Micro alive in order to make it so the Justice Department didn't force them to break up. Right. They literally kept it alive. Well, they don't keep it alive anymore. They have caught and passed Intel when it comes to those key growth areas. In 2018 and 2019, Intel struggled with hardware security vulnerabilities one of which affected all of Intel's CPUs since 1995 and is impossible to completely fix. During the ordeal, the company offered to pay security researchers $80,000 as a reward if they could downplay the severity of the vulnerabilities. In one case, Intel knew about a backdoor vulnerability that affected all of their CPUs and didn't fix it for 10 years until a hacker leaked some information on it. When Microsoft, a name synonymous with Intel, decides to build their own chips, you know something is wrong. After Apple shocked the industry with the M1 chip, Microsoft announced that they would be using ARM technology to build their own chips. They already use ARM-based Snapdragon chips in some of their Surface line computers, but these can't hold a candle to the M1. So Microsoft is getting serious and building something by themselves. If this chip is competitive and low power, this would be yet another blow to Intel. And on another point, macOS is about 10% of the total PC market, so losing this, plus ever more market share to AMD, is definitely going to hurt Intel. On the topic of Intel struggling with their manufacturing process to try and get to 10 nanometers, in July of 2020, then CEO Bob Swan stated that if more things go wrong for Intel, they may use a third party like Samsung or TSMC. Swan would be fired in early 2021, but Intel would still go through with the plan, stating that for their 7 nanometer process, Intel would outsource manufacturing of these chips for products starting in 2023. And this is actually a bright spot for Intel, a key point in this entire story. This decision may actually be the best thing for the company in many years. Swallowing their pride and admitting that they just couldn't hold their position in chip manufacturing is definitely a turning point for Intel. 
The semiconductor industry is inherently risky. Companies must bank on the fact that these technologies have to work. They have to be well planned to beat out the competition. But as Intel found out, when things go wrong, they can go very wrong. Intel tried to both manufacture and design their own chips, but they couldn't keep up with global foundries in the US or the Korean or Taiwanese companies. But don't get me wrong, financially, Intel is doing very well. Their desktop market is still solid and they have a huge legacy and they're making a bunch of money hand over fist. Intel aren't going away tomorrow, but consumers are starting to be unsatisfied. And the recent turn of events in the past three years was a wake up call for Intel. Firing CEOs from accounting backgrounds like Bob Swan and many previous CEOs, and finally putting an engineer in charge, as well as swallowing their pride when it comes to manufacturing, could see a major turnaround. And it must be said, in the grand scheme of things, all of this is not easy to do. In any CPU, there's billions of transistors, nanometers in size, and every single one of them has to be perfect. It's incredible that we can achieve such amazing feats of engineering in the first place. The DNA of Intel has clearly changed since their inception, but that's expected after 50 years. So what do you think is next for the company? Do you think they'll be back to the darlings of the semiconductor industry in a few years? Or will they be the next IBM? Feel free to discuss below. So I want to thank you for watching the whole way through this episode. I really appreciate it. If you did enjoy it, feel free to subscribe to Cold Fusion. I also recently went on the Tech Society podcast if you're interested, so I'll leave a link below to that as well. My name is Dagogo, and you've been watching Cold Fusion, and I'll catch you again soon for the next episode. Cheers, guys. Have a good one. Cold Fusion. It's me thinking.